A murderer and his girlfriend flee across the Atlantic after committing one of England's most infamous murders. Little did they know that justice was waiting on the other side of the pond. Our moment in crime is the case of Dr Crippen. Mr and Master Robinson were travelling to Canada in order to start a new life. Given the fact that the 20th century was in its infancy, it would take the SS Montrose days to cross the Atlantic. This didn't bother father and son. They passed the time by reading and discussing the wonders of new technology. The SS Montrose had been equipped with wireless telegraphy, which was brand new at the time. But what Mr and Master Robinson didn't realise was that the captain of the ship, Henry George Kendall, had seen through their disguises. Captain Kendall had recognised Mr Robinson as the wanted man Dr Hawley Crippen and Master Robinson as Dr Crippen's mistress, Ethel Leneve. Justice would be waiting for the pair on the other side of the Atlantic. It didn't take long for Dr Crippen's crime to become part of a popular song at the time. The lyrics were as follows. Dr Crippen killed Belle Elmore, ran away with Miss Leneve, right across the ocean blue, followed by Inspector Jew. Ships ahoy, naughty boy. Andres Skinner and Myron Augustus Crippen welcomed their son, Hawley Harvey Crippen, into the world on the 11th of September, 1862, in Coldwater, Michigan. As a child, Crippen knew exactly what he wanted to be when he grew up. He wanted to be like his uncle Bradley, who was a doctor. By the time he grew up, Crippen was five foot five, had brown hair, grey eyes and wore gold rimmed spectacles. He studied at the University of Michigan's homeopathic medical school and graduated from the Cleveland Homeopathic Medical College in 1884. Tragedy struck in January 1892 when Crippen's first wife, Charlotte Bell, died of a stroke. After Charlotte passed away, Crippen decided to move to New York City, but not before sending his two-year-old son, Hawley Otto, to live with his parents, who had moved to California. In New York City, Crippen began to practice homeopathy, it was in the early 1890s that Crippen married Corrine Cora Turner. The exact date of their marriage varies. Cora had been born to a German mother and a Polish-Russian father in 1873. Cora dreamed of being a music hall singer and chose the stage name Belle Elmore. She was 19 years old when she met Crippen, her future husband and murderer. In 1894, Crippen began working for Munyon's homeopathic remedies, specialising in eye and ear treatment. In the late 19th century, homeopathy was popular, especially within the mail order industry. Munyans dealt with mail orders and Crippen helped Munyans to grow. The following year, Crippen became the general manager of Munyans Philadelphia office. Crippen was an expert at increasing sales and when tasked with opening an office in Canada, he did so successfully. When Munyans decided it was time to tackle the overseas market, they chose Crippen to complete the task. With a guaranteed salary of £10,000 a year, Crippen and Cora moved to London, England, in 1897. In London, Crippen and Cora first lived in Piccadilly. But life abroad wasn't easy. 
The couple constantly argued and were often unfaithful to one another. Cora began an affair with a former Chicago prize fighter named Bruce Miller. Crippen learned of the affair when he found love letters Bruce had sent to Cora. But Crippen and Cora were determined to turn Cora's dreams into reality. Cora was given the chance to show off her musical talent at the old Mary LeBone Theatre with a libretto she'd named The Unknown Quantity. Sadly, the show closed after a week. In London, Cora first used the stage name Cora Motsky. However, she began using the name Belle Elmore after audiences began calling her Cora the Brooklyn Matzos Ball. Crippen was sure that he could help Cora become a success. After all, he'd proven he had a talent for business. In November 1899, Crippen bought a full page in a playbill to advertise Cora's career, listing himself as her business manager. When Munyans learned about this, they fired Crippen for spending too much time on other interests. With no money coming in, the couple were forced to move from Piccadilly to Bloomsbury. Crippen was hired by the Sovereign Remedy Company, but after eight months the business failed. Crippen then created his own nerve tonic he called Amaret, but this venture also failed. By December 1901, Crippen had found work as a consulting physician at Drouet's Institute for the Deaf on Regent's Park Road. Drouet's was a mail order business that specialised in treating ear ailments. It was at his new job that Crippen met his mistress, Ethel Leneve. Ethel was born Ethel Clara Neve on the 22nd of January 1883 in Dis, Norfolk, to Walter and Charlotte Neve. She had five younger siblings, and when Ethel was seven, the family moved to London. She first met Crippen at the age of 18. She had just graduated from Pittman Secretarial College, and with the help of her sister Nina, she found work as a shorthand typist at Druette's. When Nina left the company, Ethel took her place as Crippen's private secretary and bookkeeper. Crippen was besotted by Ethel. If Ethel had to work late, he would walk her home. If work needed to be finished at the weekend, he would bring it to the Neve family home, where they would finish the work on the patio. Crippen liked to buy Ethel dinner at her favourite restaurant. By the early 1900s, an affair had begun. With Crippen finding stable work at Druettes, Crippen and Cora moved to 39 Hilldrop Crescent, a three-storey detached townhouse on Camden Road. They rented the home for £52 a year, not bad considering the house had two parlours, a study, several bedrooms, a kitchen a pantry, an attic, two toilets, a garden and a coal cellar. By now, Cora had become a member of the Music Hall Ladies Guild, which raised money and clothing for down-on-their-luck theatre performers. It was at the Guild that Cora met Marie Lloyd, the Guild's founder, Lil Nash, one half of the Hawthorne sisters, and well-known mime, Paul Martinetti's wife, Clara. Cora became the treasurer of the guild in 1906. Even though Cora's lover Bruce Miller had moved back to Chicago that same year, she wasted no time in starting more affairs. The vast number of bedrooms at 39 Hilldrop Crescent allowed Crippen and Cora to take in lodgers, to help increase their income. In November 1906, the couple took in three exchange students, 
from Heidelberg University. Cora began to teach one of the students English and, on the 6th of December, Crippen realised that Cora was having an affair with this particular student. Crippen sought comfort in the arms of Ethel and from then on, Crippen and Ethel referred to the 6th of December 1906 as their wedding day. Crippen then made the decision to leave Druets and with Dr Gilbert Rylance he opened the Yale Tooth Specialists located in the Albion Building on New Oxford Street. Crippen employed Ethel at the new business. Cora was fully aware of the affair between her husband and Ethel. Cora even knew why Ethel had left her family home and moved into a boarding house in Hampstead Heath. Ethel was pregnant. Sadly, Ethel later miscarried. Crippen and Cora's respective affairs would continue over the next few years. You'll catch your death. These were some of the last words that Clara Martinetti said to Cora. It was the evening of the 31st of January, 1910, and Clara and her husband, Paul, had been invited to the Crippen's house for dinner. Cora had asked the couple to stay the night, but the Martinettis decided to go home in the early hours of the morning. As Clara and Paul left 39 Hill Drop Crescent to get into a cab, Cora tried to walk her friends to the cab. But Clara stopped her. It was a cold night and she didn't want Cora to catch a cold. Clara and Paul didn't realise that they were the last people to see Cora alive. The sequence of events that follows next is a theory put forward by London coroner and barrister S. Ingleby Oddy. After the Martinettis left that night, Crippen made Cora a drink. On the 17th of January, Crippen ordered five grains of the poison hyosin from the chemist Lewis and Burroughs. Hyosin is produced by plants that belong to the nightshade family. Crippen mixed the hyosin into Cora's drink. Oddie believed that Crippen hoped Cora would die in her sleep and that he planned to call his friend Dr John S. Burroughs, saying that he'd found Cora dead in her bed. Crippen had recently told Dr Burroughs that Cora wasn't well. But when Cora began to react to the poison right away, Crippen shot her in the head with his forty five calibre revolver. This gun was later found in the house, and the neighbours reported hearing screams and a loud bang. Oddie believed that Crippen then cut up his wife in the bath. Cora's torso was wrapped in some of Crippen's pyjamas and buried in the cellar. Her ribs and spine were burned in the kitchen stove. The rest of Ethel's remains were placed in a sack, weighed down with bricks and dumped into the Holloway Sanitation Canal. Crippen told Ethel that Cora had left him a couple of days later. She began wearing some of Cora's jewellery. Crippen pawned off the rest of his wife's jewellery for £3,195. The ladies' guild that Cora belonged to soon received a letter that had been signed in Cora's name. It read... Dear friends, please forgive me a hasty letter and any inconvenience I may cause you, but I have just had news of the illness of a near relative, and at only a few hours' notice I am obliged to go to America. Under the circumstances I cannot return for several months, and therefore ask you to accept this as a formal letter resigning from this date my honourable treasureship. The Guild's members were suspicious. The handwriting didn't look like Cora's. On the 24th of March, 
the Martinettis received a telegram from Crippen that said Cora had died the previous day. Crippen had recently told the Martinettis that Cora had developed pneumonia. Crippen later said that Cora had been cremated in America. Ethel was told by Crippen that Cora had died while they holidayed together in France. When they returned to England, Ethel moved in with Crippen. The Ladies' Guild began to do their own investigating. They discovered that the only ocean liner that was sailing to the US when Cora was said to have left was the latter rain. However, it was being repaired at the time Cora supposedly left England. Crippen had told those who had asked after Cora that she had died in California. The Guild discovered that no one with Cora's legal or stage name had died in that state. The Guild took this information to Chief Inspector Walter C. Jew of Scotland Yard. Inspector Jew became a detective when Jack the Ripper was prowling the streets of Whitechapel. It was now the middle of summer and Inspector Jew decided to speak with Crippen. Crippen told the inspector that Cora hadn't died. He'd made this up because Cora had actually fled to the US to be with her lover Bruce Miller. Crippen didn't want to suffer any embarrassment. Inspector Jew was happy with Crippen's story. The decision that Crippen made next was the one that led to his downfall. Fearing that the police were onto him, he fled England with Ethel, who had been told that a scandal was about to break out. They ended up in Antwerp, but mainland Europe wasn't far enough away, and on the 20th of July, Crippen and Ethel boarded the SS Montrose, disguised as Mr and Master Robinson. Canada, Crippen hoped, would provide him with a safe haven from the law. At the request of the Guild, Inspector Jew went to 39 Hilldrop Crescent once again. Scotland Yard had been told that Crippen and Ethel had not been seen in some time. The house was searched three times, and it was during the final search that Inspector Jew discovered that some of the bricks in the cellar floor were loose. Underneath the floor lay the remains of a torso. A medical examination of the find revealed that the torso belonged to a woman. Bleached hairs were found with the torso, and Cora was known to bleach her hair. A scar was present on the torso, and Cora had once had an operation on her stomach. The police were now on the hunt for Crippen and Ethel. Captain Kendall of the SS Montrose had noticed that something wasn't quite right with Mr and Master Robinson. When Captain Kendall boarded his ship, he brought with him a newspaper that had printed photos of Crippen and Ethel on the front page. Captain Kendall was sure that Mr and Master Robinson were really the wanted doctor and his mistress. On the 22nd of July, Captain Kendall sent a telegram to the White Star Line in Liverpool. It read, Have strong suspicion that Crippen London cellar murderer and accomplice are among saloon passengers. Mustache taken off, growing beard. Accomplice dressed as boy, voice, manner and build undoubtedly a girl. Both travelling as Mr and Master Robinson. Kendall. On the 31st of July, the SS Montrose docked at Father Point in Quebec. Before Crippen and Ethel could leave the ship, Captain Kendall invited the couple to meet some pilots who had just boarded the ship. Crippen realised that the law had tracked him down when he recognised the pilot as Inspector Jew. Crippen said, Thank God it's over. 
the suspense has been too great. I couldn't stand it any longer. After receiving the telegram, the White Star Line sent the telegram to Scotland Yard. Inspector Dew contacted the Canadian authorities and then booked a passage on the White Star Line's next journey across the Atlantic. The Laurentic left Liverpool on the 23rd of July and because it was a faster ship, it was due to arrive in Quebec the day before the SS Montrose. By the time Crippen and Ethel arrived at their destination, Inspector Dew was waiting for them. The pair were arrested on board the SS Montrose. Captain Kendall's telegram became the first wireless telegram that led to the arrest of a wanted person. Crippen was tried at the Old Bailey in London from the 18th to the 22nd of October, 1910. The abdominal scar found on the torso was shown to the jury and they were informed that Cora had a similar scar. The jury learned that traces of hyosin were found in the remains. The bleached hair found in the remains that were similar to Cora's were mentioned to the jury. The defence argued that Cora had left England and headed to the US to be with her lover, Bruce Miller, who had gone back there in 1906. Cora had apparently told Crippen towards the end of 1909 that she was leaving him and that she was withdrawing all of their money from their bank account. His defence team argued that the Crippens had only lived at 39 Hilldrop Crescent since 1905 and that a previous owner may have buried the torso in the cellar. It took the jury 27 minutes to find Crippen guilty of Cora's murder. As for Ethel, her trial took place on the 25th of October. She had been charged with being an accessory after the fact, but after 20 minutes of deliberation, the jury found Ethel not guilty. Crippen was taken to Pentonville Prison, where Ethel visited him each day. Each visit was followed up by a letter. While at the prison, Crippen tried to kill himself with broken glass from his glasses, but he was stopped. On the 19th of November, Crippen was told that the Home Secretary, Winston Churchill, hadn't granted him a reprieve. On the 23rd of November, 1910, Crippen was hanged. Crippen was buried with Ethel's letters and a photo of her. Ethel left for Canada the day that Crippen's sentence was carried out. She went to Toronto, where she worked as a typist for a few years. Eventually, she returned to London under the name Ethel Harvey and began working at Hampton's Furniture Store near Trafalgar Square. She married Stanley Smith in 1915 and they had two children. Ethel spent the rest of her life in Croydon, where she died in 1967. In the recent past, forensic scientists at Michigan State University have raised doubts about Crippen's guilt. The scientists said that mitochondrial DNA evidence showed that the remains in the cellar were not Cora's. DNA taken from Cora's great nieces was compared to DNA taken from tissue preserved from the remains. The remains were also tested for sex using a highly sensitive assay of the Y chromosome. The scientists said the remains belonged to a man. They also argued that scar tissue shown at the trial, which was said to be consistent with a scar Cora had, wasn't actually a scar because the tissue had hair follicles. Scar tissue does not. Others have argued that the DNA used in the tests may have been contaminated or mislabeled 
and that the great nieces who provided DNA samples were not blood relatives of Cora's. David Aranovich, a journalist, argued that the technique used to determine the remains' sex is new and had only been carried out by the team at Michigan State University. He pointed out that the tissue sample used was described by the scientists as a, quote, less than optimal sample, end quote. The scientists also asked New Scotland Yard to provide samples of the hair found at the scene so DNA testing could be carried out to prove whether or not the hairs belonged to Cora. New Scotland Yard denied the request but offered to carry out DNA testing on a hair themselves. The scientists, however, chose not to pay for the testing to be carried out. In December 2009, the Criminal Cases Review Commission declared that the Court of Appeal will not hear the case to pardon Crippen posthumously. 39 Hilldrop Crescent was never occupied again. It remained empty and stood as a reminder of an unhappy marriage with a grisly outcome. The house was destroyed during the Blitz. But even if the torso in the cellar didn't belong to Cora, two questions remain. Who did the torso belong to? Who put the body in the cellar? <laughs>